Good afternoon and welcome to our DPC Education Center webinar of the month, What Dialysis Patients Need to Know About Emergency Preparedness. Before we begin, uh, we have just a few reminders to go over. All of your lines are muted. Please keep them muted throughout the program. If you have any questions or comments during the program, please use the chat box. It can be found in the upper uh, right part of your screen. You will receive the link to today's recording as well as the slides within a week. And please complete the feedback form at the end of the program, which can be found, uh, a link to it will be placed in the chat box. So it's my pleasure to introduce our presenters today. Danielle Daly is an executive director in the IPRO ESRD network program with over two decades of experience in implementing innovative programs to ensure that patients receive appropriate, timely, and equitable care. Ms. Daly leads a team of social workers aimed at improving experience of care for individuals with renal failure. She fosters collaborations with dialysis providers, state health departments, transportation agencies, Office of Emergency Management and Healthcare Coalitions to develop and implement emergency preparedness plans that support access to care for dialysis patients. Julia Detman is the ESRD Network Program Emergency Lead and Patient Services Coordinator. Ms. Detman works with a team of social workers to process grievances, ensure access to care, and coach facilities on working through behavior changes. She has a, a background in working with individuals with mental health and substance use. Michelle Prager is the Quality Improvement Project Lead for Home Modalities in the IPRO ESRD Network Program. Ms. Prager has 10 years of dialysis experience with four of those years in social work and six as a facility administrator. And we have Neeland Lewis, um, who experienced kidney failure in 2010 and has been both a home hemodialysis and in-center patient. Mr. Lewis is a member of the IPRO ESRD network in the South Atlantic Medical Review Board, Patient Facility Represent Representative Alliance, and ESRD National Coordinating Center Affinity Group, serving as a subject matter expert and quality improvement champion. In addition to his work in the ESRD community, Mr. Lewis has been a guest speaker at numerous community and private events held throughout the US, Europe, and Canada. His key areas of focus have been project management, professional development, human interaction, and effective communication skills. Today, our speakers are going to discuss how emergency preparedness is essential for patients to ensure continuity of their care. It is important for people on dialysis to plan ahead for emergencies and disasters in order to stay safe. Specifically, today's program will provide information that will help dialysis patients understand types of emergent events, how travel can impact care, what to ask your team, what supplies may be needed, benefits of home dialysis, and patient personal experiences. At this time, I'd like to hand things over to Danielle Daly to begin our discussion. Thank you, Hannah, and uh, welcome everyone. I really appreciate the opportunity to talk to you about emergency preparedness and um, some key things that can help out um, patients um, in the event of an emergency. Uh, next slide, please. So I want to tell you a little bit about um, ESRD networks, if you're not aware. So the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, or what we call CMS, was established, um, establishing a national health care insurance program back in 1972, and this was for people with end-stage renal disease. And then ESRD network organizations were authorized by CMS to encourage self-care dialysis, uh, kidney transplantation, and to clarify the reimbursement procedures, and this was going to help to achieve a more effective control of the costs of the renal disease program. 
And now today, there are 18 ESRD network organizations that are under contract with CMS, and you can see them here um, on, on the map. And they serve as the liaison between the federal government and the providers of ESRD services. And the network organizations are defined geographically by the number and volume of ESRD beneficiaries in each area. So as you can see illustrated here, some networks represent just one state, like Network 14, which is the entire state of Texas, and others um, are a multiple state network. Uh, next slide, please. So the ESRD um, network organization's responsibilities include various things. So it's improving the quality and safety of dialysis related to services provided to individuals with end-stage renal disease, also providing technical assistance to ESRD patients and providers when needed, encouraging patient engagement at the facility and network level, and that's really being involved in, in all types of activities um, related to their care. Um, evaluating and resolving patient grievances and facility concerns, supporting ESRD data systems and data collection to measure the quality of care, and then really why we're all here today, um, supporting emergency preparedness and disaster response. Next slide, please. So the ESRD network emergency responsibilities are to prepare, mitigate, and respond to emergent events. Um, the ESRD networks are really the foundation of CMS's emergency management structure, and we work in collaboration with the Kidney Community Emergency Response um, Coalition, or also called CASER, and they are the national response coordinating contractor. So much like how CMS has contracts with networks to ensure quality of care, CMS also has a contract with CASER to ensure that there is good response to emergencies. And now the networks monitor conditions that might uh, impact facilities' ability to provide services to dialysis patients, and we work to mitigate risks and provide technical assistance to dialysis facilities and help them develop comprehensive emergency plans for their facilities. Um, we also establish relationships with state emergency management officials and healthcare coalitions um, in the regions that uh, each network supports. And then during an emergency event, we work to identify challenges and barriers um, impacting patients and facilities, and we collaborate with the stakeholders um, at the local level to make sure that we either reestablish interrupted services um, or maintain them um, as quickly as possible. Next slide. Also part of that is uh, that networks work um, uh, or constantly watching um, for pending events, such as weather events, and then we activate internal staff to support those needs. Um, we will put together emails, um, either warnings or alerts about pending events, and then we also request operational status reports from ESRD providers. And through those reports, the network is able to collect the open, closed, or alt altered treatment schedule status from the dialysis facilities. Um, that information is then provided to CASER. Um, it's called an Emergency Situation Status Report. Uh, here's another acronym for you, ESSR. And then that, that facility report um, is, is then provided um, also up to CMS to make them aware of any challenges and barriers um, that is being experienced um, in a specific area. And then the networks really are supposed to ensure that all patients and facility needs are identified and that the resources are, are um, located during the emergency event and they're deployed appropriately. Next slide, please. So the survey and certification um, department um, of, of CMS, um, they certify ESRD facilities for inclusion in that Medicare program. And it's important that they validate that the care and services of the facilities meet specific criteria of sta uh, safety and quality standards. And that's called the conditions for coverage. So I'm not sure if that's something you've heard in your facility before, but the CFC or conditions for coverage um, are really um, what guide the um, reimbursement um, uh, procedures for facilities as well. And make Make sure that they are qualified um, under a CMS program. So there's an initial certification process and then ongoing monitoring that happens. So it's not just to open facility, it's also to maintain a facility. And then there's a link here to the ESRD code of federal regulations. And that's where you can really see the specific conditions um, of coverage and conditions for participation related to emergency preparedness. So when this presentation is shared, all these links are live. I encourage you to go in there and take a look. Next slide. 
So the dialysis facility must um, comply with federal, state, and local emergency preparedness requirements, and these emergencies include, or include but aren't limited to, fire, equipment for power failures, um, care-related emergencies, water supply interruptions, and natural disasters um, that are likely to occur. And then the dialysis facility must establish and maintain an emergency preparedness program that meets the specified requirements. And the program must include the following elements. So they need to have an emergency plan that ensures continuity of care. It includes a backup um, facility uh, memorandum. It also needs to um, be evaluated and updated at least annually. There have to be policies and procedures about implementing their plan, um, risk assessments, communication plan. Um, and then that communication plan also has to make sure that they're communicating with the Department of Public Health, their Office of Emergency Management, and community partners. Um, and there's a, a mechanism also to release a request for assistance. Again, needs to be reviewed and updated at least annually. Um, training, testing, and orientation is important. So the facility is required to at least conduct um, annually, um, whether it's a full-scale exercise, a functional exercise, a mock drill, a tabletop exercise. Um, that's something that, that needs to be tr um, tested both with their facility staff and also patients. Again, being evaluated and updated at least annually. Um, there needs to be integrated healthcare systems. So, if a dialysis facility is a part of a healthcare system um, that's consisting of multiple um, certified healthcare facilities, they want to make sure that there is good backup and continuity of care and that this plan is then integrated across all those continuums of care. Um, again, a memorandum on understanding with the backup facility and that they are required to contact the network and the public uh, Department of Public Health about any service interruptions. Uh, next slide, please. There were some updates um, that took place to the conditions for coverage um, because of COVID. So in September 30th, uh, 2019, or prior to COVID rather, there were um, some updates that were done to um, have some provisions promoting more program efficiency and transparency, also reducing some burden, in implementing file safety requirements for dialysis facilities, and then also hospital and critical access um, changes, promoting innovation, flexibility, and then improvement in patient care. So again, more links here. If you're so inclined to take a look, it's important to understand the legislature that goes around um, the requirements for emergency management. Next slide, please. And I'm just going to stop here, and I hope um, everybody um, can get to the polling. I see there's some call-in users, but for those of you that um, have access to chat, I'm curious if your facility has provided education about emergency plans. If you can go ahead and drop that in chat, we'd love to hear some um, feedback from you, um, whether or not emergency plans have been discussed at your facility. Next slide, please, and we'll keep monitoring that, so please feel free to use chat. So emergency management partners, um, there are a lot of partners that are working together to make sure that there is good um, uh, emergency management for dialysis patients. So we have the network at the center there. I mentioned CASER to you. Um, there's also the Department of Public Health. There are local community coalitions, all the dialysis facilities, patients. We have ASPR, CMS, um, lots of federal and state level partners. So just want to show you how we're all intertwined. Next slide. And this slide here is going to give you some links to those federal partners. Um, again, please go and look on their websites, understand who they are. Um, CMS and, and, and the federal government does talk in a lot of acronyms. So you have FEMA, ASPR, CMS, HHS. Uh, just want to make sure everyone's familiar with those. Next slide, please. And then your local partners, um, again, your local state public health department, please go onto their websites. Google any healthcare coalitions in your area. I'm sure your dialysis facilities are partnered with them. Making sure you have direct communication with your police and fire departments. You know your electrical utility providers and water service providers. If there's an event that impacts your house, please make sure that they know you're on a high priority list that you should um, have services restored. Uh, next slide. And then also mentioned is the Kidney Community Emergency Resource Coalition, or CASER. Here's their website here. This is the um, federal contractor for emergencies specifically related to dialysis. Um, so please become familiar with their, um, their resources and their website. 
And then next slide, please. I have one last um, one last group that, uh, if you're not familiar with the American Kidney Fund or AKF already, um, in 1971, it was a group of friends that came together. They saved about 79 lives, and their grand mission was born last year. The AKF celebrated 50 years of fighting for patients and families. So quite a, um, a, a phenomenal group to also find resources in, specifically um, even um, financial resources, especially during an emergency. Next slide. There's a link here on this next slide that um, if you do need to get any disaster relief information or funding, I encourage you to visit their website. Um, they certainly have um, uh, resources allocated during emergent events, and they can be a great resource to the community. Uh, I'm just going to stop there and, and pause for a second. I know um, I'm seeing some feedback here, and I'm glad to see that there, um, there are um, facilities that are conducting their emergency management training. So love to hear that. I am going to turn it over to my colleague, Julia Detman, on the next slide and talking about emergency events. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Danielle. Hi, everyone. Um, next slide, please. So I want to start by defining what is an emergency. Emergencies can be local, meaning only affecting a small area like a county statewide, which is exactly how it sounds, affecting the entire or most of the state. Regional, meaning it affects a number of states, or national, affecting the whole country. An emergency can be weather-related, a structural emergency, which may alter your facility's ability to operate, a public health issue, such as a pandemic, a man-made event like terrorism or even lack of supplies, or a transportation event, whether it's a bridge closure or whether or not allowing for transportation to run. Next slide, please. So I'm going to talk a bit more about the types of emergencies as well as some ways to prepare for them. When we think of emergencies, most of us think of a weather event. Inclement weather is something that we all, no matter where we live, can be significantly impacted by. As an individual with ESRD, the way weather affects you is much different than how it affects the general population, though. Weather can affect your ability to receive safe transportation and at times your facilities, operations, and ability to safely open. It also affects your ability to get treatment because unless you're a home patient, and even if you're able to drive yourself, having to commute to treatment using some sort of vehicle is likely something you're doing three days a week, give or take. Weather can be anything from a blizzard or snowstorm, much like the one that's happening currently in the Midwest, or it can be flooding, a tornado, wildfire, hurricane or earthquake, just to name a few. Next slide, please. So staffing shortages, structural damage, power outage, and water issues are all emergencies that can impact your ability to receive treatment at your facility. This year alone, we've received quite a few notices of facilities closing certain shifts or completely closing their clinic to altogether. And while staff are working really hard to ensure your treatment isn't disrupted, as a lot of you know, your facility relies heavily on water and power. In the event your facility loses power, most facilities have access to an emergency landline and while a lot of us have gotten rid of our, alert, our landlines at this point, they still are able to operate in a power outage and are affiliated with an address. So if you have one, emergency responders can better locate where calls are coming from. A lot of facilities also have a generator on hand or can obtain one in the event of an emergency, but it's important for you to know what your facility's backup plan is in the event they aren't able to open. As I said, we've been receiving an increase in reports of pipes bursting and the facilities not being made aware that their area will be affected by these pipe issues, sometimes for prolonged periods of time. Next slide. So we've all been impacted by a public health emergency at some point in our lives, COVID being the most recent one. Um, that being said, as someone with ESRD, the way that you're affected by a public health emergency can really affect the way you receive care. A public health emergency can be anything from a natural disaster like the wildfires in California to contaminated drinking water affecting a population's access to clean drinking water. Our public health emergencies are chemical threats, radiological threats, and disease outbreak. Next slide. A man-made emergency is also something we should all be prepared for when thinking about how to handle emergency situations. A man-made hazard can include biological agents, hazardous materials such as a truck, rail or pipeline, mass gatherings, active shooter, biological terrorism, and supply shortages. Your clinic's emergency plan should include what would occur should a man-made emergency happen. Next slide, please. So 
So as I previously mentioned, transportation plays a really big role in emergency situations. Events that can affect transportation, such as a bridge collapse, flooding, a really big accident on the highway, or a train derailment can also affect your ability to successfully receive treatment. While your facility will likely outreach to your transportation providers if an emergency were to happen, I encourage you all to be empowered in knowing how and who to contact within your transportation company. In the event of an emergency, it's really important to have an open line of communication with your agency and driver to stay up to date on what's happening. Recently, as some of you guys may have heard, there was a catastrophic snowstorm in the western region of New York. Because of how rapidly the area receives snow, a travel ban was implemented for non-essential travel. While dialysis is considered essential travel, most of the transportation agencies did not have access to vehicles with four-wheel drive. So some patients relied on neighbors or friends, some were picked up by facility staff, and others were able to be brought in via police and National Guard. Next slide. So with all these things in mind, I want to briefly cover all of the elements that need to be working in harmony in order to treat to receive treatment successfully. First off, we need space, and this quite literally means just a room or building in which you receive treatment. Next, we need electrical power, water, supplies like dialyzers and chairs, personal personnel, otherwise known as your nurses and technicians, a doctor's prescription, and the ability for them to call 911 to get help if needed. All these elements really function together and rely on one another for you to have a safe treatment. Next slide. So one thing I know that happens when you're initially diagnosed with ESRD, and something I've even talked with my patient subject matter, Neelan, about, is how when you're initially diagnosed with dialysis, it can be really overwhelming. There's so much to take in all at once, and although your team should be reviewing emergency plans with you, and it sounds like a lot of them are, there's some questions you may want to ask in order to feel prepared. Some helpful questions might be, what is my facility's emergency plan? How will my facility contact me if there's an emergency? How will I receive dialysis if my facility isn't able to open? How can I best prepare for my home for an emergency? What should I do if an emergency happens during treatment? Where is my closest medical needs shelter? And you may know some of these things already, but in case you don't, this is a really good starting off point to segue into a conversation surrounding preparedness. I think when we're prepared, we feel a lot less anxious about what might happen. Next slide, please. So having a to-go bag ready is really important and relatively easy way to stay prepared and ready for an emergency like the ones we discussed. Your to-go bag should include water and food, such as unsalted peanut butter, low sodium tuna or chicken, dry cereal or canned fruits and vegetables. It should also include health documents, such as a copy of your photo ID, a list of your medications, a copy of your insurance or Medicare card, and contact information for your healthcare team. It's also helpful to have things like a flashlight, extra medications, cell phone charger, disinfectant wipes, and a mini first aid kit in your to-go bag. Lastly, having things like a toothbrush and toothpaste, a blanket, and a change of clothes can be really helpful to keep packed at all times. So as an example, as I previously mentioned, we worked with the facility in upstate New York after the really big snowstorm, and they ended up having some patients and staff that were stranded at the facility overnight. And even though this doesn't happen often and shouldn't happen often, a lot of the things I listed would have been really helpful to have on hand. And as you can see on the slide above, this is something that you can even purchase. Putting it together yourself is, of course, easier and more personalized to your needs, but they are available for purchase online as well. Next slide, please. Below is a quick example of a shopping list. Keep in mind, you don't have to purchase all these items at once. I know it's a lot, but you can do so as they go on sale and when they're available with a coupon. I also encourage you to work with your facility dietitian on this list as we all have different medical needs. And while these items are good for some, it might not be good for you or you might have dietary restrictions or allergies. And your dietitian can ha definitely help put together something that's going to work best for your body in the event of an emergency. Next slide. So these are some additional resources that can help you prepare. Um, I encourage you to check them all out if you can. We have CASER, we have FEMA on there, we have the Red Cross, and as Danielle previously was mentioning, NKF. Next slide, please. So I also have a polling question I would love for you guys to answer in chat. Um, so what other things do you think would be helpful to have in a to-go bag? I know everyone has different things that they feel are really essential 
for their comfort. Um, is there anything else that you didn't hear me list that you think would be helpful for a dialysis patient to have in a to-go bag? Give everyone a minute. Phone charger, thank you. That's a big one. I agree. Okay, we'll keep those coming and I'll move on to the next slide. I think we are going to Michelle. Hello, my name is Michelle and I'm going to talk about home modalities and emergency management. Next slide, please. I'm going to talk about the different types of home dialysis, peritoneal dialysis, as well as home hemodialysis, the benefits of being on home dialysis and emergency management and home modalities. Next slide, please. So peritoneal dialysis uses the inner lining of your abdomen as a filter to clean your blood. Um, patients have a PD catheter placed in their peritoneum and they do treatments using a fluid called dialysate that is put into the PD catheter using um, the small flexible tube. There are two types of PD, continuous ambulatory uh, peritoneal and continuous cycling of peritoneal dialysis. Next slide, please. Ambulatory peritoneal dialysis doesn't require any needles. You do manual exchanges that are performed every three to six hours. The exchanges take um, 30 to 40 minutes. The peritoneal dialysis catheter is required to do the exchanges. Um, there's no machine required with this type of dialysis and no partner is required. Next slide, please. Continuous cycling peritoneal dialysis does require a PD catheter as well. It is performed at night while the patient is sleeping. It usually take, lasts eight to 10 hours. Um, there is sometimes a midday exchange needed, um, as we talked about with the CAPD, if um, needed based on your clearance. A partner is not required for this modality either. Next slide, please. Home hemodialysis is done at home by the patient or a care partner. Um, this is like what you see done in center. The machine is much more compact. Your blood is filtered through a dialyzer to remove unwanted toxins and waste. Hemodialysis uses dialysate as well to remove the substances from your blood. And once it is cleaned, it is returned to your body. Next slide, please. Hemodialysis is done four to seven times per week at your home for about two and a half to four hours per treatment. It improves clearance. Um, you can schedule your own treatment times around your schedule. This is gentler on your heart and it is more frequent. Um, it may or may not be done with a care partner. You can draw your own labs and typically you have one clinic visit per month. Next slide, please. Um, so some of the benefits of home. Um, patients typically have improved clinical outcomes meaning ability to achieve a higher K2 over B, um, better phosphorus control, better management of comorbidities and um, other diagnoses. Patients tend to have a better quality of life, able to work and go to school. It's easier to travel. Um, you can get a case for your machine to take it with you and the supply snap where you are traveling. Um, you can spend more time with your loved ones. They can be at home with you while you're doing your dialysis. Um, fewer diet and fluid restrictions as well as, um, you know, because you're doing more treatments. Um, no one takes better care of you than you. Decreased mortality as well as decreased hospitalizations. Next slide, please. Benefits of being on home during an emergency. Um, reduced travel and bad conditions to get to the facility. PD and HHD is usually once or twice a month visits to the facility, so you can use telehealth to see your care team if you need anything, you can remain receiving treatment at home until the emergency is over and then come to the facility. Next slide, please. If there is a power outage, you can use your um, case to move your machine and supplies to go somewhere where there's a generator. There's also um, smart devices to get you help in emergency situations like Alexa or Google Home and smartwatches. You can also um, set up with your local fire department to have a lock box put on your house with a key inside that only the fire department has access to. If there is an emergency, that way they can get inside your home without 
um, having to break the door down. Next slide, please. So for PD, um, you want to make sure you have at least two weeks supply of um, stock of supplies on hand, uh, but make sure you're checking the expiration dates on those and you can do manual exchanges if there is a power outage, but make sure you have an emergency pack of medications and a five day supply of antibiotics that your doctor orders for peritonitis. Um, register with your utility company so that they're aware you need services restored as soon as possible. Routinely review how to disconnect during a power outage with your treatment team and have those instructions nearby. Next slide, please. For HHD, make sure you have at least a two week so stock of supply as well and check those expiration dates. Register with your local water and power company so it can be restored as soon as possible for you. Learn to be comfortable with taking yourself off the machine in an emergency or if you lose power. And if you're not able to continue your treatments at home, contact your treatment team to make arrangements. Next slide, please. I also have a polling question for you as well. Um, has your nephrologist talked to you about home dialysis as a treatment? And you can answer that in the chat as well. Glad to see there's some talk about home out there and a patient on HHD. We can move to the next slide while there's some answers in the chat. Thanks, Michelle. Um, I am here to talk a little bit to my patient subject matter expert and medical review board member, Neelan Lewis. Neelan Lewis, I'm so happy you're able to join us today. Um, let's go to the next slide, please. So, Neelan, I was hoping you could tell us a little bit about your journey on dialysis. Oh, Neelan, you're muted. Is that better? Perfect. Thank you. All righty. Thank you for having me today. It's, uh, it's a pleasure. Um, my dialysis journey started in 2010 with what I thought was a sinus infection. I went to the hospital. Uh, and they said, nope, it's not a sinus infection, it's uh, organ failure. So I didn't have any education on end-stage renal disease or dialysis or any of that other stuff, um, home dialysis or hemodialysis in the clinic. My grandmother um, had kidney failure, so that was my only exposure. So I thought, I said, well, man, this is kind of early. I, I shouldn't have any kind of uh, health concerns until I'm at least uh, 100 years old. <laughs> ideally. Yeah. yeah, ideally. Yeah, but um, it wasn't, that wasn't the case. I had gone through a, a very extensive weight loss program. Um, mm -hmm. I, I lost over 100 pounds, but I lost it in a short period of time and that cost me my kidneys. Yeah. So I didn't have high blood pressure, no diabetes, but still kidney loss. Now, now that I've been on it, I've made myself aware. I've gotten myself plugged into the process where I understand what happens and have um, served to uh, be a, uh, a support system for others who are on dialysis and addressing questions about um, how they deal with dialysis and their comorbidities. Thank you so much for that. I really appreciate yeah. it. Um, can you talk to me a little bit more about your history with the network and with emergency preparedness? Sure. Um, I, I actually uh, had uh, an emergency awareness event on January 12th. Um, we had a, uh, an EF1 tornado that came through our area. So that means EF1 is something, a uh, tornado with winds of 100 miles an hour. So it hit parts of Charlotte, North Carolina, took down trees. Um, falling trees on homes, power lines, you name it. And so, in fact, right in the middle of an IPRO meeting, 
um, I got an alert on my phone, on the TV, that the uh, storm watch had actually escalated to a warning. So that meant uh, get cover. So I, I excused myself from the call, gathered my family. We went to a low floor area in our home in the bathroom. And fortunately, we're not injured. Um, um, my house wasn't injured, but my yard had uh, been littered pretty well with fallen branches from the wind. That sounds really scary. Um, can you talk? About, oh, sorry. Go ahead. No, I said it was um, because we didn't know what the outcome was. But um, I did some emergency preparedness. I've got some experience in that. And so a lot of the things that Julie and you spoke of, um, I had um, a quick kit. So I just grabbed it. It was ready to go. Um, and I took that in the bathroom with me. Can you tell me what you keep in your kit? So in my <laughs> kit, it's a Ziploc bag. I've got a couple of Ziploc bags and I keep those in a canvas bag, but things like flashlight, um, uh, emergency water, a couple bottles of Desanti. Um, mm -hmm. I keep uh, uh, non-perishable foods like crackers and little wrappers. Um, I had a, and they were all kept in a gym bag in a safe spot. So uh, medications that I would use on a normal basis, mm -hmm. those are in the Ziploc. Because think about it, if if, um, if a flood hits or if a tornado hits and you don't have water, you're going to need water. If your house gets deluged in, in water, your medication could get uh, destroyed. So having that all in a Ziploc bag um, was very helpful. In fact, I even had my phone and charger in a Ziploc bag. But they were all easily accessible within like five minutes or not even five minutes. I would say 30 seconds. I just That's grabbed them and and got my family organized. One of the, you know, honestly, one of the things I find uh, very helpful is not to panic. Because when you when you panic, you don't think. Right. You just react. And sometimes okay. you can take yourself from a safe environment to a non-safe environment. No, you're absolutely right. Do you feel like being a dialysis patient has caused you to have to prepare more for emergencies or feel more prepared? I think so, because um, say, for example, uh, well, with the dialysis patient, you know, a lot of us, we're dialyzed uh, three to four times a week, right? And and, and that, in that three to four hours a week. So our kidneys, in many cases, are not working. Um, and so we rely on dialysis to live. It's life sustaining. So if you think about a person that has full kidney function, their kidneys are working some 24 hours a day and seven days a week. A dialysis patient, you're looking at maybe 14 hours a week with treatment. So in a disaster, what you have to think about is, hey, I'm not going to be able to get to my center. Is my cell phone charged up so that somebody knows where I'm at. So say, for example, if your roof caves in, you can't get out of the bathroom where I was at. I had access to my phone. So it wasn't um, a house line. It was actually cell phone so that I could call out if I needed to. The other thing, um, I also have taken it, taken the uh, advantage of contacting my utility companies to let them know if they should have a local or regional outage that, um, hey, you got a, a patient here, and we've got to keep that in mind when you're uh, setting service back on. Yeah, that's great. That's great that you've done that. Um, that's something that we definitely suggest that patients do, um, just to stay prepared and make sure that everybody is kind of in the loop about your situation without giving away too much, of course. That's right. Um, do you feel like you've been able to have the opportunity to work with your treatment team to find more ways to be prepared for an emergency? Absolutely. And so on a regular basis, I, I would, I want to say quarterly, um, our patients have to sign a document that, that attests that they know where to go in the case of an emergency. Um, it's not just follow who's screaming and running towards the door. Right. You know, it, it details uh, where you're to go how to disconnect from the machine, if you're capable of disconnecting from the machine, or if you're not, then they um, they plan around that. 
great. Yeah, that's awesome. I'm I'm glad that they are in touch with you about that and that you feel like you're able to communicate with your treatment team about those things. And the, I other, thing, the other thing too, as a um, a patient uh, facility rep, I I also keep a, a tight relationship with the patients. So right. when they come in, even if it's just as small as on Valentine's Day, hey, here's a rose, or here's some some candy, Happy Valentine's Day, or how are you doing today? Hey, how did that surgery go? How are you feeling? Oh, I heard you had your cataracts removed. How do you feel? Um, are you having any complications? I think the relationship part is critical. Absolutely. Uh, we have to continue to communicate. Now, as a project management um, uh, practitioner, one of the things that we do, 90% of our job is communication. Right. Because without that, you can't move forward. And, and the same is true in the dialysis setting. Because a lot of the patients, sometimes they feel maligned and they don't feel that um, they're listened to always. So it's good to have an, a patient advocate. Absolutely. Absolutely agree. And I'm glad you're able to have that communication and, and push others to also be able to communicate with their, their healthcare team and other patients. Sure. I know you and I had talked about um, some tips and tricks that you have in, in preparing for an emergency. Do you mind sharing some of those with the group? Sure. So tip number one, create emergency food supply, um, three days worth of food, paper, plastic wares, and a manual can or bottle opener. First aid supplies, a flashlight with batteries that work. That's important. Check your flashlight periodically. You, you, you don't want to go into a disaster and say, hmm, last time I checked this flashlight was two years ago. Guess what? Absolutely. It probably does not have good batteries. Okay. So, um, and if you, if you can have a crank radio, um, then that way it doesn't rely on batteries. Um, I also keep a cell phone fully charged at all times. In fact, right now my cell phone's charged. Um, because you don't know when a disaster is going to hit, right? Absolutely. And, and that's all in the, all in a Ziploc bag. Um, also, uh, you know, if, if you begin to hear weather warnings on your TV, pay attention. That's not the time to watch Matlock. That's the time <laughs> to watch what the, what the news uh, is telling you, uh, the news, what, uh, the, the National Weather Service is telling you about watches and warnings when severe weather threatens uh, to danger life and property. So you, you wanna be on top of that. And there are of course advisories, watches, warnings, and emergency. Those are kind of the four categories that the um, National Weather Service um, puts. And lastly, more importantly, keep that Ziploc bag where it's accessible, immediately mm -hmm. accessible. And, and understand what it means if your power is disrupted. What would you do if it's disrupted 30 minutes or 30 days? Um, dialysis patients have to keep stash of drinking water and water to bathe as well, non-perishables um, uh, that fit within your, met, your, um, your diet plan for your dietitian at your center. But you know, if you can't get dialysis, you, you probably need to limit your intake. So have that discussion in advance. When you go to dialysis tomorrow or, or, or Tuesday or whenever you go, make plans to talk to your dietitian. What things should I have in my bag? I know that phosphorus or potassium are issues for me. Sugar may be an issue for some or salt. What specific things might I wanna have in my go bag? And in that gym bag, I got one hanging on the door in my office and it's easy to grab. Oh, lastly, I said lastly before, but um, I try to keep my car full on gas. And that's a New York thing, I guess. Growing up in, that's a good in Buffalo, one. Growing up in Buffalo, New York, I was born and raised Bill's fan and taught always, always keep your car no less than a half tank, especially in the wintertime, because you don't know you might get stuck. Keep a blanket in the car, mm -hmm. you know, things of that sort. And and even though I don't live in New York now, I'm in I'm in Charlotte, North Carolina, I still hold fast to those same principles. Keep your car full. You know, because if you if something happens and you gotta get away from your home and maybe you need to go to a neighboring city for dialysis, you, you have some mobility. Absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you so much. I, I really appreciate this. You are a pro. And I know you've been through this before. Is there anything else you wanted to add? 
Um, you know, we're we're experiencing, a, a, you know, right now, I guess in Ohio, they had uh, a, a train derailment, right? Who who would have guessed that 24 hours before that happened? No one. No one saw that coming. There's no uh, email or chat group or or um, uh, uh, social media site that's going to say, hey, tomorrow there's going to be a train derailment and it's going to spill toxic uh, liquids all around and maybe compromise the soil and things of that sort. Nobody knows that kind of thing. But for a dialysis patient, we have to we have to think proactively. What if? And I'm not trying to stir up panic. Panic and preparedness are two different things. Preparedness means that, okay, this is winter. We're having storms. Um, sometimes there are power outages. So do I have a bag if I need to? Um, preparedness means that, hey, I live near a major rail line. What if? What would I do? Um, and even if you don't live near a major rail line, you know, take the time, call your major utility companies and let them know. It, this is free. This is a free service. Call your utility companies. Let them know, hey, I, I'm disabled because as a dialysis patient, you are technically disabled. I'm disabled. I'm in my home and I just need me to be added to a list. And uh, I think that that'll be helpful. Definitely agree. Thank you so much. That was a really good point. I know that's something that that's in a lot of news areas right now. It's it's something that's very out there, and I think it's great for all of us to consider what would happen if that happens near me. So I really appreciate it. You're most welcome. I think we're going to move into some questions. Next slide, please. Anyone have any questions for the chat box? All right. Well, while we're waiting um, to see if anybody has any questions for our speakers, um, I actually had one that came up when Neeland was talking. Um, specifically, you said, you know, during a an emergency, you know, don't panic. Try not to panic. You know, just just try and get it. Do you have any tips on how to, you know, maybe if if an emergency starts to happen and you're starting to find yourself getting worked up, do you have any tips on kind of, you know, calming yourself down a little bit and making sure you're able to to do these steps? Well, sometimes it, it can be as simple. Yes. Thank you for the question. Sometimes it can be as simple as just breathing, inhale and exhaling. I saw a movie once where they said you you woosa, you know? Um, you just, you know, you don't allow yourself to get into a frenzy and you, you begin to think, okay, what is it that I'm dealing with? What are my options? And what have I done in advance to prepare myself for this? Because here, here's a truism. Um, when I was working on my doctorate, um, I did, uh, my, my dissertation was on um, the, the moral enemies of, of, believe it or not, panic <laughs> and intellect um and they don't work well together when you're panicked you don't think you can't think so what you want to do is de-escalate your emotions and say okay we got this this is important but i will make it through you have to have a positive mental outlook that's critically important the other thing too just like when you're on a plane it tells you Take care of yourself before you take care of the person sitting next to you. Slightly different if you're in a home. So when we had the tornado hit, the first thing I did was, okay, don't panic. Breathe. Think. What do you have? You have your bag. Okay. Let's get that into the bathroom. Take care of you first. Then secondly, everybody, this is what's going on. It's probably may not hit us, but let's get into the bathroom just in case. And so to, to keep that um, sense of calm, when we were in the bathroom, I was I said, so, hey, what did you what did you do today at work? Um, take their mind, kind of deflect away from the panic situation rather than say, oh, my God, we're going to die. No, that's not the right approach. Um, you know, if you got young children, hey, let's sing a song. Do you know any songs? What song do you like? And so if it's a tornado. They, they're usually quick, five minutes, in and out. So after that, you know, you may feel the house shaking a little bit, and you just say, hey, that's a nice song. 
uh, 15 bottles of beer on the lawn, yada, yada, you know, or whoever, whatever you want to use, you know, maybe the, the theme from, from Frozen. <laughs> um, but, but the important thing is not to panic and to give your, create a sense of calm for yourself and those around you. Thank you so much. Um, those are some really excellent tips for that. Um, all right, it looks like we don't have any questions that have come through the chat box other than, yes, this session is being recorded. Um, both the slides and the recorded session will be available within a week. Uh, so, Danielle, Julie, Michelle, and Neeland, thank you all so much for being here today and sharing this incredibly important information with our viewers. Um, and thank you to everyone who joined us. Thank you, Next, Hannah. Um, next month, we will have a bit of a different program. Um, on March 23rd, we will have a pre-recorded webinar available, which will be given by a nutritionist, and it's going to, dis to discuss the calories needed for losing, maintaining, or gaining weight. And we're very pleased to be able to work with this presenter again, Maria rodriguez Leon. Uh, she will be giving the presentation in Spanish. And again, it will be a pre-recorded session made available to watch on March 23rd, uh, but please do still register on our website in order to receive an email when that presentation goes live. And again, I'd like to thank our speakers who, turn, who um, joined us today and those who tuned in. Uh, the feedback form has been posted in the chat, so please do take a few minutes to fill that out. And we hope that you have a great rest of your afternoon. Take care, everyone. Thanks for the opportunity. Thank you so much. Have a great week.